what's up. I'm just gonna say it. Pork chops aren't very good most of the time, and that's not your fault. We buy them at the grocery store aspirationally, we get them home, and then we don't really know what to do with them, unfortunately. So my goal is to show you how to make them juicy and tender, and then how to turn them into dinner. We're gonna do a little side dish with some cheddar grits, and then we're gonna glaze up the chops with a little honey ketchup thing that sounds weird, but tastes super dope. To get started, I'm gonna need some really nice pork chops. Today, I'm using two eight ounce pasteurized pork chops. And as you can see, they're bone in. The pork loin in the middle is nicely marbled with fat. There's some really flavorful red spinalis meat on the outside. And then there's a bunch of rib fat on the back end. And this is an ideal looking pork chop in my opinion. The fully boneless, low fat pork chops that most grocery stores sell can work for this recipe in a pinch. But if you can get something that has a little bit more fat on it, of course, there's gonna be a lot more pork flavor. Now to make these chops impervious to overcooking, I'm gonna brine them for that a high sided container goes a thousand grams of water, hundred grams of salt and 50 grams of sugar. I'm keeping this brine super minimalist here because these chops are gonna be covered in a pretty intense glaze later on and any flavorings that I add to this now is gonna be out competed by that glaze. Once that's all dissolved, in goes the chops. And if you need more brine, that's easily scaled up. I'm gonna say one kilo's worth for every pair of chops you're gonna cook. Now I'm gonna load these into the fridge for two hours to brine up and we will check back then. While those brine, let's make some grits. For that, I need a tall sided saucepan and I'm gonna drop that onto the stove over medium high heat. Once that's good and hot, in goes 200 grams of grits. I'm using Bob's Red Mill grits here, also known as polenta, it says right on the back. And I do use this product for both of those foods. There's really no difference between the two. They're both cooked cornmeal. I like this one because it's more finely ground and it cooks a little bit faster than something that's super coarse. To get some additional flavor into these grits, I'm gonna be dry toasting them over medium high heat. I learned this trick from a chef friend of mine and it really changed the game as far as grain porridges go for me. It brings a lot more flavor. Once that's starting to smell, just a little bit like popcorn, maybe 45 seconds or so into toasting, we're gonna add 700 grams of chicken stock. I'm gonna stir that up and then bring this all to a simmer. As this comes up, it's gonna start to thicken pretty rapidly and the bubbles are gonna start to get all thick and kinda ploppy. That's a good thing. Once this is all thickened and at a simmer like this, we're gonna pop a lid on it, turn the heat down to low and cook this for 25 to 30 more minutes. During that 30 minutes, we're gonna come back and stir things up at least three times. This starchy corn loves to create a film on the bottom of the pot and that can easily burn without very much stirring. And for whatever reason, it really tends to build up in the corners of the pot. So I'm gonna use my whisk to kind of scratch those down. And if your polenta or grits are looking kind of dry, you can always add a few more splashes of stock in there. That's gonna keep things moist. The lid goes back on and we're gonna keep on cooking. After 30 minutes total of cooking this over low heat, it's time to taste these grits to see if they're ready. The texture should be pretty soft and kind of starchy throughout with no hard husky bits of under hydrated corn and these taste really good, but they're not seasoned at all. So in goes six grams of salt, I'm gonna stir that in. And now I like to let these rest off to the side to continue to hydrate and get even starchier and creamier while we cook our chops. These pork chops have been in the brine for two hours and now they should be properly protected from drying out when cooked with high heat. To get these ready for the pan, we're gonna lay them out on a little baby sheet tray and then dab them up with some paper towels. We're gonna be pan searing these in just a second and any moisture that we can get off of them right now is moisture that's not gonna sizzle up and steam up our chop in the pan. And there we go, that's a great looking pork chop. Sent to me by the sponsor of this video, Porter Road. Porter Road is an online butcher shop that delivers high quality meat directly to your door. They do dry aged beef, pasture raised pork, chicken, lamb, and all kinds of sausages and butcher cuts. One thing that I think is really cool about Porter Road is that it was started by two friends in Nashville as a proper butcher shop. And now they're selling meat on the internet, you guys. It's a great source for meat that's been raised humanely on pasture the right way without any added hormones or antibiotics. You can order online a la carte, just like you would at the butcher, or if you wanna re-up on meat, on the regular, you can sign up for a subscription. From there, they hand cut the meats and then ship them to your door, mostly fresh. The only frozen thing that I got was the sausages, and that's pretty cool. So if you wanna give Porter Road a try and access the same chops that I'm using in this video, click the link in my description and you'll automatically get 15% off your first order. If you order over $100, they'll ship it to you for free. 15% off your first order, the link is in my description. Thank you, Porter Road. Now to cook these chops, I'm gonna preheat a 10 inch nonstick pan over medium heat. Turn on the gas, and the clock reset. The hell? Once that pan's preheated, in goes a generous squiz of neutral cooking oil, maybe 30 grams, two tablespoons, and then I'm gonna drop in just one of these chops. 
Visually, I think it's easier for you guys to see me cook just one chop at a time, but both eight ounces would easily fit into a 10 inch pan. Right away, you'll notice that I'm making it a point to really press this chop into the pan. That's because to get maximum surface area on the sear, we need to make sure that that meat is not gonna contract and curl up like it wants to in that first minute or so. Also, I wanna note that I'm cooking this pork chop over pretty gentle medium heat. That's mainly because this chop is a thicky boy and if we cooked it over high heat, the outside would be way over seared and blackened basically by the time the inside was up to an edible temperature. After five to six minutes on that first side, we're gonna take a quick peek. This chop has great deep color across the entire surface area as you can see, and that looks great. We're gonna flip it over and continue to sear on the other side over medium heat for another four to five minutes. If you're seeing that little bit of char on the edge there, that's totally fine. Remember that the brine had a little bit of sugar in it, and that's not singed meat right there. That's a little bit of caramelized sugar, and it should taste pretty good. Another added bonus to cooking a chop this slowly, like we are over medium heat, is that you get plenty of time to fully render out the fat. Think of bacon. If it's under rendered, it's kind of flabby and gross, but if it's properly rendered, meaning all that fat is properly melted, it tastes amazing. One last touch here to properly cook this chop is to come back and baste this first side with some of that rendered fat and the fat that's left in the pan. I'm mainly basting it around the bone area because that's gonna take the longest time to come up to temperature. And now, after about seven to eight minutes of paying proper attention to this pork chop, it's time to take its temp. Right now, it's at 130F or 55C, roughly, give or take. And that's still just a little bit undercooked, but I am gonna be pulling it out and you will see why in a moment. For now, that's gonna go onto a little resting tray where we make the sticky part of this sticky chop. Over at the stove, I'm gonna wipe out the pan fully. Get all that fat out of there. Cut to me making the mistake of not pulling all the fat out of the pan. I was left with a very delicious, but very oily pork sauce, and that's not very pro my bro. Once that pan's dried out and well heated over high heat into the pan goes half of our sticky pork glaze. What's that? How do you even make that, Bri? Well, into a high-sided container, I measured a quarter of a white onion that I grated on a box grater. Pro tip, if you're gonna be grating an onion, make sure to keep the stem end on. That's gonna hold all the layers together while you shred it up into pulp on the box. Behind that comes three cloves of minced garlic, 75 grams of honey, or molasses would be a fun variation if you wanna make this a custom joint. 75 grams of the real mother sauce, you guys ketchup, 25 grams of hot sauce, 15 grams of cider vinegar, 20 grams of Worcestershire, and finally 75 grams of water. That's going to get a stir to combine and make sure to get the bottom scraped up a little bit because that honey's kind of heavy and it tends to sink. Now, once it's up to a hard simmer, we're going to continue to cook this over high heat to reduce it, stirring constantly. We're going to take this stuff to the point where nearly all of the water has evaporated out of it and all that's left is onions, garlic, and the sugars from the ketchup and the honey. Once everything's at this point, we're going to let them sit there and continue to cook until they're on the edge of just starting to caramelize. This is gonna bring some depth of flavor and darken the sauce into something that's less barbecue and a little bit more grown up. Once that redness is just starting to turn into that light reddish purple, we're gonna deglaze this with 75 to 100 grams of water and stir everything back together to dissolve. Now the onions and garlic should be just starting to get fully tender at this point and the sauce should have just a little bit more depth to it. From here, I'm gonna repeat that same reduction to the point of nearly burning just one more time. In classic cookery, this is close to the gastrique technique. This is where you take a sweet liquid and reduce it until it's caramelized and then deglaze that with some kind of other liquid, usually an acidic one, and you're left with a fun, really deep flavored sauce that has some acidity to balance out all that sweetness. The whole process here only takes about five to six minutes to do two full times. If you wanna get a touch of depth without actually doing this double cooking, I would say add a splash of molasses in the beginning and then five to six grams of chili powder and then just reduce it till sticky. Let's cut to that version actually. I've made this a few times since I filmed this video. It's super dark and a little bit smoky from that chili powder, and I really love this variation. I will include the instructions for this one in the description. Okay, back to the caramelized ketchup version. The sugar here has been dissolved into the water and everything's back up to a bubble. Now in goes the pork chop. From here, I'm gonna baste the pork chop with that sticky mixture as it reduces back to a glaze. That last little bit of heat from the glaze is gonna give the pork chop the temperature boost that it needs to get it to 145F or 62C. I like my pork chops with just a little bit of rosy pink in them, but if you need an all white pork chop, go above 150F. Once the bubbles are getting big again and that pork chop is indeed sticky with the sauce, it's time to kill the heat and let this chop rest. Look at this chop. It's fatty, but it's fully rendered and all of that savory porky flavor is gonna be amplified by this sticky onion caramelized ketchup glaze. 
That's a dope chop. But to make this into a proper finished plate, we need to finish these grits. I'm gonna throw these back over on the stove, add a little bit of chicken stock, maybe about 150 grams this time to get everything back to being saucy. Now I'm gonna add in 75 grams of unsalted butter, bring that up to a simmer, whisk in the butter, and then in goes 125 grams of sharp cheddar and 50 grams of grated Parmesan cheese. The cheese and the butter are gonna to come together to make these grits super luxurious, but you might need to add a little bit more stock to get this to the right texture. For me, I like a drier polenta that looks kind of like a thick mashed potato, but if you like it saucy, add a little bit more stock. Lastly, and very importantly, we need to give this a taste to see if it needs any salt. I'm gonna give it a pinch and there we go. Let's plate this thing up. First thing down is gonna be these cheddar grits. As you can see, they kind of hold themselves up on the plate. I'm not sure if that's Southern style or not, but that's how I like them. I don't do soupy grits. Behind that comes my perfectly glazed pork chop. I'm gonna top that with a few big dog spoonfuls of sticky porky sauce. And wow, the onions and garlic in there are almost candied and they bring a really nice savory edge to an otherwise kind of sweet sauce. You guys, it turns out that pork chops on cheesy grits is now one of Lauren's most favorite meals of all time, right up there with shrimp and pasta vodka. This one's simple and easy to make, it's craveable to eat, and it pushes me to cook something new. I love it all, let's eat this thing.